I do have a disclaimer. So yeah, um, I've spent over 30 years practicing and researching holistic health as a university professor, as an integrative doctor. As um, Autumn said, I've published more than 100 scientific papers and multiple textbooks on simple practical solutions that promote health and wellness. So that's what I'm all about, simple practical solutions. But I've also spent years developing business interests and with that same purpose. So I'm currently the owner of Beautiful Water. It's a filter company, Extreme, the Extreme Wellness Institute, Maruya Hot Springs in New Zealand, Extremely Alive Wellness Tonics and Pronoia Press. Therefore, I have to declare I've got a commercial interest in some of the products and services that I recommend in this presentation. Um, and um, I've also been trying to pre prepare a pandemic survival guide, which is a lot of this information in this presentation with active links to other resources. Um, I was hoping to have it ready for today. However, um, my graphic designer, one of, or her, one of my graphic designer's husband, got the jab two days ago and ended up fitting that night and couldn't be revived. And he's now in intensive care. And so, and for other reasons, I just, I don't have that ready. But if you go to my website, drmark.co and you subscribe, put your email in, I will email you that no cost um, as soon as that's ready. And hopefully they'll be ready in the next couple of days. So, so yeah, I've spent um, 38 years at university. Uh, more than three decades of wellness research. The research I've mainly done is, is, and my areas of expertise are really in the area that have no money behind them. So things like, and I've published yeah, 100 papers on yoga and, and blood pressure and yoga and heart rate variability, and oxygen and flow states and sleep. So I'm very published in yoga and breathing on the Buteyko method and dysfunctional breathing on meditation, looking at brain function and mindfulness, lots of stuff on herbs and nutrients. Um, I'm probably most well known for um, writing Braun and Cohen. I, Leslie Braun was my first PhD student. She was a naturopath and pharmacist. And together we wrote a textbook um, that's the standard textbook for the last 18 years for all naturopaths and pharmacists who learn about herbs and supplements. Um, I'm very passionate about bathing and research saunas and hot springs. I've done a lot of work in integrative medicine, a lot of research in acupuncture, massage and pulsed electromagnetic fields. And I'm really interested in lifestyle. So I'm looking at organics, organic food, health retreats, detoxification, elite, elite athletic performance, and home health hazards. And I'm gonna bring all of that information together in this one presentation. So you're really gonna get a download of 40 years of, of study um, in this presentation. And hopefully I'm gonna make it really accessible and hopefully even enjoyable for you. Um, so yeah, um, I have, I've published a lot of books. The, the row at the back is the Herbs and Supplements books, now in its fourth edition, which is two volumes. The first one started out at um, 400 pages, then it went to 800, then it went to 1200. The fourth edition is now 1600 pages of herbs and natural supplements. I've published books on you know, doctor's favorite natural remedies, uh, the first textbook on the global spa industry. But I, I think I'm most proud of my, they, they call them children's books, they're illustrated books. They're actually um, really profound books for adults that are accessible to children. And that's Bing and Bang Begin and The Beautiful Mare. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about them because I have really you know, poignant messages for these current times. So that's just, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. And to get today, what I want to cover today, and I'm really inspired by Hippocrates and the Vix Medicatrix Naturae, that you know, the healing power of nature. I'm going to talk about water, herbs, ferments, heat, and mindset. And what I want to cover is basic ways to improve your health and well-being, support immunity, and prevent viral illness how you can upgrade your water and reduce toxicity with or without a filter, common sense guide to healthy eating to maximize nutrition and minimize toxicity, how to brew your own probiotic health tonics and how to boost your own gut health and immunity, how to use body temperature and safely build resilience and enhance immunity, um, how to identify home health hazards and, and simple practical solutions to reduce them. I wanna give you daily routines to create a wellness culture that will infect you with good health. Um, I want to talk about over-the-counter nutrients and herbs to help treat and prevent viral infections and also spike protein disease. Um, simple ways to reduce anxiety and boost immunity with very little cost training or equipment. Um, biohacks that you can use as emotional first aid so you can relax on demand. And how to apply the a power of positive thinking to make decisions and how you can access the inner well of your being and become fearless and resilient and extremely well. So yeah, it's a big, a lot, a lot of big promises there in, in, in an hour or so lecture. We may go over time. I'm happy if we have to, but um, let's see if I can, I can live up to that promise. So and I do want to talk about the immune 
systems three lines of defense and this is like this is immunology 101 there's three line lines of defense which is the first is the skin and the mucosal barrier that's the surface layer of defense the second is the innate immunity which is your local defense which is just under the skin and then acquired immunity which is systemic it goes through your blood and the skin's mucosal barrier is the first um, line of defense and that covers your skin the mucous membranes in your nose and your mouth and genitals your hair um, and hair in your nose your cilia that line your nose and chemicals that include sebum and ly ly lysozyme that are secreted by your skin these are super important and they're often not talked about in terms of protecting you from viral um, um, pathogens and then we're going to talk about innate immunity and the one i'm going to focus mo mostly on is fever and heat using heat but but the innate immunity covers phagocytosis complement interferon and inflammation which happens locally and then we're not going to talk that much about uh, acquired immunity, which is um, you know, B cells and T cells and antibodies, which is really where most of the medical world focuses. So I, I tend to focus on the things that other people don't focus on, and I do the research that doesn't have money. But anyway, that's that's the way it is. So I'm, I'm a big fan of permaculture and getting the basic things right. And um, to paraphrase, and I haven't found this in writing, but when you, I've heard. Bill Mollison said a few times different ways. And Bill Mollison, who's the founder of permaculture, says when you get the basic things right, the other things tend to go right by themselves. But if you get the basic things wrong, it's very difficult to play catch up. And when I was putting together all the what, what are the basic things for health, I came up with this recipe. And it's a recipe for wellness, which is super simple. So the recipe for wellness is bathe in beautiful water, prepare delicious food, make the most of every breath dance through every mood, tend the soil beneath your feet, embrace sunshine from above, share your gifts with all the world, fill your life with love. Now we're gonna unpack that a little bit, but that's that's wellness. You, know, you don't need two PhDs and a medical degree and spend 38 years at uni to come up with that, but to, to put into action, actions harder. And I wanna start with bathing. Remember I talked about the, the skin as being your primary defense. So bathing is really the key to wellness. Um, and clean water is the simplest, the cheapest, and the most effective health intervention on earth, bar none. There's no, there's no pharma, pharmaceutical, there's no vaccine, there's no medical technology that can provide the health benefits globally that just providing clean water can, can provide. And you know, bathing, including you know, sanitary practices, just washing your face and body and um, hair along with hand washing and cleansing after toileting menstruation, it just plays a vital role in preventing and controlling disease. And hot and cold bathing and activities um, that balance hot and cold um, activates your immune defenses and build cellular, physiological, and psychological resilience. And we're going to unpack some of that. Um, so water. So we're starting with water. You know, bathe in beautiful water. It's the start of the recipe of wellness. And water is the matrix of life. And water is wonderful. It's the most complex and mys mysterious substance on earth. Um, actually in the universe. There are 72 anomalies, scientific anomalies that cannot be explained about water. So if there's magic in the wor world, it's contained in water. Water is the basic operating system for all of life. It holds your memory and consciousness and water won't stay sterile. Water naturally comes alive whenever it can and it supports microbial ecosystems that are actually essential for our health. However, water also transfers toxicity, it spreads pathogens and stagnant water naturally grows mold. But if you count the, 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 your body, you're two thirds water by volume or by mass. But if you look at the molecules in your body, you're 99.9% .9 water molecules. That's because water is tiny compared to collagen and nucleic acids and proteins, which are massive. So you are 99.9% .9 water and water is the most uh, important structural element of your body. Yet most water is toxic and tap water is is extremely toxic. Um, tap water commonly contains, you know, actually it's better called tap liquid. It contains you know, intentional poisons, chlorine um, and other disinfection byproducts, bacteria, viruses and other microbes, volatile organic compounds, sediments, heavy metals, radioactive elements, re residues, pollutants, emerging contaminants. And this class of emerging contaminants includes a whole range of things that aren't commonly tested for, that includes pharmaceuticals, personal care products, endocrine disrupting chemicals, steroids, other hormones, surfactants, flame retardants, pesticides, industrial additives, microplastics, nanomaterials, and gasoline additives. So that's what's in most of our water. Um, and that's what we're 
bathing in. That's our first line of defense is being assaulted every day by these toxic products. And the skin's microbiome is incredibly complex and we're just still learning about that. that that's, and it actually it serves in our first line of defense. Now, when I started medical school and you know, when I was a doctor, we were taught that the skin has a surface area of about 1.8 square meters, which is about the size of a single bed. Yet about two years ago, they recounted that and they realized that every time that there's a hair follicle or a um, sweat gland or a sebaceous gland, it dips down and dips up. And if you count all those glands, the skin has a surface area of 30 square meters. And that's the largest epithelial surface for interacting with microbes. And these microbes serve in the first line of defense against pathogens and they educate the systemic immune system. So they're constantly talking and presenting new things to your immune system through your skin. And you, know, you want to respect that. So we know that clean water moisturizes, hydrates, and cleans better than any beauty product. I know people buy moisturizers and hydration lotions and cleansers, but just clean water is the best beauty product you can ever use. Um, but if you're using tap water with chlorine in it, that chlorine will oxidize your natural body oils and it will kill your natural bacteria and move the bacterial colonies towards more pathogens and disrupt the whole skin's microbiome and that your first protective barrier. So it's probably, depending on where you live, it's probably more important to filter your bathing water than your drinking water, which most people don't realize. So why filter your bathing water? I'm, I'll, you know, I know I'm talking fast. People can you know, get the recording and slow it down, but I want to get through a lot. So. You know, the 10 reasons to filter your bathing water. Well, bathing exposes you to more water and hence more toxicity than drinking. You might drink two liters, but you're bathing 200. Volatile organic compounds outgas because generally you bathe in hot water. And when the water's heated, chlorine and other disinfection byproducts go out and you absorb them through your skin and your lungs. And when things go through your skin and your lungs, they directly enter the um, bloodstream um, bypassing the liver. And you also, you spend a lot of time bathing. You might spend half an hour in a bath or, you know, 10 more minutes in the shower. So you've got more time for dermal absorption and inhalation. And these disinfection byproducts, which are chlorine and chloroform and trihalomethanes, they irritate your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your respiratory tract and genitals. This is where viruses penetrate. Um, so if that's irritated, you're already, you've, you've blocked your, your natural defense. So this is where um, viruses get in, you know. So a mask is not really a great defense, but your natural um, mucosal barrier is a fantastic defense. It's evolved that way. Um, and these disinfection byproducts also disrupt your skin's microbial balance. And they lead to dry, itchy skin, eczema, dandruff, dermatitis. They strip your natural body oils. And those natural body oils naturally protect your skin from drying out. They naturally protect your skin from sun damage. Yet if they're stripped away, um, it, your skin is more prone to damage and your hair um, becomes more brittle, it more tends to fall out. You're more, more likely to get dandruff, eczema, et cetera. Also, if you have hard water with lots of minerals in it, um, um, it leaves a, a soap scum on your pores, on your hair, and your, on your surfaces in your kitchen. Um, and volatile disinfection byproducts actually cause damage and erosion to your fixtures and fittings. And can talk a lot about, um, you know, um, braided water hoses that fail due to you know the detergent under the sink that uh, erodes the rubber, causing two hundred million year dollars, two hundred million dollars a year damage in Australia just from burst water hoses um, from volatile disinfection byproducts. So, you know, I am declare I have an interest in this. And this is because for, for years I've been talking about water. I'm so passionate about water. I could do, do talk all day about it. But um, at the end of the talk, I'd say, you know, you, you have to get a filter because if you, don't, if you don't use a filter, you are one. And people would ask me, so which filter do I buy? And I'd say, well, it's really complicated. And it is, it's really complicated. And I looked out at the market and there wasn't a filter that I really could endorse. So I ended up creating my whole range, a whole range. And my brand is called Beautiful Water. And for me, Beautiful Water isn't just about my range. Beautiful Water has five elements. It's filtered, it's structured, it's balanced in terms of pH and minerals, it's blessed in terms of positive intention, and it's free, which means you don't pay for the water and it's flowing, it's not um, held. So you want to filter your water because drinking less poison is good for you. And if you don't use a filter, you are one. You want to structure your water to prevent mineral scale in your pipes and your hot water service. And structured water naturally improves cooking. You get um, moister dough and better bread. It improves cleaning. Um, detergents dissolve better. Even with, without detergents, it'll clean better. And plants actually grow 30% better with structured water. So you get more plant growth with actually less water. 
Um, you want water that's balanced in terms of pH and minerals, because um, minerals are really important. You don't want to be drinking reverse osmosis disti or distilled water, which is a really aggressive solvent. You want naturally soft, naturally alkaline water, not water that's been electrocuted to be alkaline, but water that's naturally alkaline. And you want water that's blessed. And, and I, I was really fortunate to spend quite a bit of time with um, Grandma Agnes Baker Pilgrim. She's, she, she's passed now, but she was the um, chairwoman of the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. And pretty much all Indigenous wisdom says, you wanna hold your water sources sacred. Um, you wanna have good feelings towards your water source and you wanna bless your water and give thanks for your water. And you know, after the work of Masaru Emoto, um, and this is not science now, it's magic or it's, it's woo woo, but it's, it's, it's using conscious intention. And even you know, in, my, in my branding on the beautiful water, there's um, in, in very, very fine um, print, it says, I love you, I respect you, I thank you, I bless you, I am you, over and over again um, on, on the logo. But you can actually do that yourself. You can just write something on your, put it on your water meter, write these words and, and change your relationship to where your water comes from. And finally, water needs to be free. Water is life and, and water in nature flows freely and it shouldn't be a commodity. And water should be flowing, not held in tanks or held in bottles. Once water is held, it becomes stagnant and it loses its vitality. So that's beautiful water. Um, I've had trouble, there's been a whole global logistics supply, so the, the filter business is, is actually really challenging at the moment. However, I want to teach you how to do this for yourself, how you can make beautiful water at home, even without a filter. And so how do you upgrade water without a filter? Here are some simple hacks. So if you can't filter your water, you can boil it or let it stand, and it would naturally off-gas toxic compounds before you drink it. And similarly, you know, I said it's really important to filter your bathing water. Um, but if you don't have a, a whole house filter, what you can do is fill up the hot, hot bath really hot, hot and careful kids don't go in it, and just wait 20 minutes with the fan on. And in that 20 minutes with hot water, um, most of the chlorine will outgas and the disinfection byproduct will outgas. Um, and then you can have a relatively chlorine free bath without filtering it. You can also, also structure your own water using magnets. And if you just Google do it yourself vortex device, you can make these devices out of bottles to vortex your own water. You can imbue water with positive intention by placing thoughtful words on your meter or your water tank. And probably the most powerful, potent website on earth is findaspring.com. And it tells you anywhere in the world where you can find your local natural spring, where you can go and get natural spring water. And I actually have a course through the Extreme Wellness Academy on the wonders of water, um, which goes through all the difference between reverse osmosis water and distilled water and um, uh, you know, all the different types of water. And then it talks about filtering, structuring, balancing, blessing, and, how to, and water freedom. So yeah, upgrading your water, that's getting the basic things right. So let's talk about, you know, we've bathed in beautiful water, now we're gonna eat delicious food. So how do you eat delicious food? Well, the general dietary recommendations, which I've been talking about for well over you know, 25 years, is eat lots of color and lots of variety and eat food that is slow, which means seasonal, local, organic, and whole. So that's a pretty simple recommendation. I'm not a big fan of diets, but I'm, I'm a really big fan of guidelines. So then for this presentation, I've, I've just I've challenged myself to come up with more practical guidelines. And I've come up with, you know, two sets. So one is to maximize nutrition. And you'll notice throughout this presentation, throughout medical school, you know, I spent 38 years at uni, I was always, you know, trying to make mnemonics and, and simple ways to remember a lot of information. So a lot of this presentation has a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, alliterations and there's poems and things that help you remember this. So to maximize nutrition, you want to maximize the five F's. So you want to maximize fasting. So extend your over, you fast anyway, you fast overnight. So you know, wait until you're really hungry before you eat. And when you're really hungry, then your body body's prepared for the food and you'll digest it better and process it much better. So maximize fasting, maximize the flora in your diet and eat leaves, roots, flowers, fruits, and fungi. Eat from all the different parts of the plant kingdom. You wanna maximize ferments and, and microbial diversity. So sauerkraut, kombucha, kimchi, kefir, yogurt, etc. cetera, you know, pickles. Um, so maximize ferments, maximize the flavors. So salty, sour, bitter, pungent, sweet. There's a whole Chinese, I mean, each one of these topics can be a whole lecture in itself. And then you wanna maximize feasting on fresh food and favor whole over processed, plants over animals, organic over conventional, 
homegrown or homemade over bought and slow and social eating over, over fast and alone eating. So again, this is not a diet. These are just guidelines. So if you favor those, you know, whole plants, organic um, home and slow and social, um, you know, you're going to improve your diet. And there's a mnemonic there, you know, shop whole. If you'll read it backwards, so slow, slow home, organic plants, shop whole. So there's a way you can remember the things to maximize. So then you also want to eat to minimize toxicity. So you want to minimize the five Ps, which is packaging. And you want to reduce packaging and food with labels or any food with TV ads. Try and get them out of your life totally if you can. You want to minimize pesticides because eating less poison is good for you. And we actually did a whole study on that, that if you eat organic food for one week, you reduce your pesticide load in your urine by 90%. So it's a published study um, on my website. You can go look that up. Um, you want to minimize plastics because they become perilous, persistent, poisonous pollutants. Um, you want to minimize pharmaceuticals because they're often potent poison pills and they're just sold for profit. So would, and, and they're actually the poison schedule. The pharmaceutical schedule is the poison schedule. And you want to minimize politics. And that's politics around eating and those things because you want to eat for fun. And most politics, in my, my experience, directs actions towards an opposition rather than creating solutions. So you want to, you know, Maximize the, the Fs and minimize your Ps when it comes to eating delicious food. And you want to let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So that was from Hippocrates. You've probably heard that. And here's a, that's just a photo of my snack bowl. Um, and these are super immune boosting snacks. So you might have heard of hydroxychloroquine and zinc and how zinc is really good for um, inhibiting viral replication because zinc inhibits viral RNA polymerase. And hydroxychloroquine is a zinc ionophore, which helps um, get zinc inside the cell. Well, pepitas have really high zinc. You know, pumpkin seeds are really high in zinc and hemp seeds are really high in zinc. And, and bioflavonoids such as quercetin, um, catechin, epicacin um, are found in dark chocolate, berries, rose hips. They act as zinc ionophores. So you can have, you know, um, a drug and, you know, a zinc tablet, but wouldn't you rather have chocolate coated goji berries and pepitas and just grab a handful and snack on that? So, you know, dark chocolate goji berries and pepitas are super snacks. And this has the same properties as a zinc ionophore, like in fact, ivermectin is a zinc ionophore and so is hydroxychloroquine. Um, but you can actually diet on this all the time and not only will it help prevent, you know, viral infections, it'll, it'll keep you healthy across a whole range of um, health conditions. So yeah, super snacks, um, uh, preventive medicine, but they're also fun and delicious. So what happens in cold and flu season though? So you know, flu season increases our risk of, of illness because the dry cold air reduces mucociliary clearance. And we're gonna talk a bit about what that is. Remember, we, we put that, that's the first line of defense. So dry air you know, reduces the ability to clear stuff in your nose. Um, you have less sunshine, which reduces vitamin D. You have less fresh food during winter, which reduces nutrition. There's less activity and you're living in close, close quarters, which reduces exercise. And often close quarter living can be moldy and damp buildings, which actually also reduce your immunity. So there's many reasons why people get, you know, um, flus and, you know, and coughs and colds and viral infections during flu season. And if we dive a little bit deeper into this first line of defense, and um, again, because it's not often talked about, but your first line of defense is really in front of your face and it's in your nose. Um, and the importance of nasal mucosa, I can't, um, I can't imagine it can be overstressed. So, and it's really sophisticated technology. You've got a, a layer of sticky mucus that traps um, pathogens and dust and pollen on the top. Then there's a layer of watery mucus. And under that, that layer of watery mucus is cilia that beats 10 to 15 times every second. And they move that, that the top layer of mucus about a millimeter every minute towards the back of your throat, where you can either cough it up or you just swallow it. And in that um, mix are these antimicrobial and immun immunomodulatory molecules, mucins, defensins, lysozymes, IgA, secreted globulins and cytokines that find new viruses that can destroy them. But they can also, there's cells there that can present these new, if there's a new virus or a new substance, it can present it to these um, mucosal cells, antigen presenting cells, and show it to your immune system and say, hey, there's something new here. What do you think about it? And you can actually build antibodies that way. And that way you can get exposed to viruses and never get sick and just um, create antibodies straight away. And then there's a physical bar barrier that has desmosomes, adherence, and tight junctions. And that's the barrier between the cells. 
But if your nose dries out, those barriers, those barriers crack and viruses and, and other um, pollutants and particles can get in. And that's, that's when you get sick. So how do you support that first line of defense? Well, make the most of every breath. Um, so avoid smoke, avoid air pollution. You wanna keep your air warm and humid. Now humans, we like to live in between 40 and 60% relative humidity. Below 40%, we get cold, dry air, we get viruses. Above 60%, we get hot, humid air, we get mold. So we really live in a sweet spot between viruses and mold. So if you keep your air warm and humid and warm air will hold more moisture, you'll support that nasal, that nasal clearance, that first line of defense. You also wanna have in winter, you know, warm air and go outside and have UV light, which actually deactivates and destroys viruses. And then you know, the traditional Australian remedy, putting your, you know, your face over a, a pot of hot um, water with maybe some eucalyptus or um, tea tree and doing essential oil inhalation. And there's many different essential oils that have mucolytic, so they break up the mucus so if it gets too dried out, um, and anxiolytic, which calms you down, um, and calmative properties. So you can you know, choose your essential oils. But there, there are so many ways, it's a whole other lecture on how you can support um, your nasal mucosa to avoid viruses getting in in the first place. And if they do get in, then you just, you're aware of them, your body will say, oh, it's a new virus. And then you'll um, be able to cope with it without getting sick. So, you know, I've talked a bit about the microbiome, but healthy living requires healthy ecosystems. Again, this is a permaculture principle and our biomes aren't just within us, they're on us and all around us. And they're under attack. So you know, when we bathe, often we bathe in chlorine. So we're attacking the skin microbiome. Um, our bowel and microbiome in our bowels are under attack by chlorine that we drink, by antibiotics and pesticides that we eat. Um, there's, there's trillions of viruses, not just millions, trillions of viruses in the air around us all the time. But if we use chemical air fresheners, um, where you know, inhaling these uh, often endocrine disrupting chemicals and, and other toxicants. So we want to have fresh air, not artificially chemically scented air. Um, our body is under attack by antibacterial products and our buildings are under attack by disinfection, um, disinfectants. And not to say that you want, you know, dirt and you want to encourage um, microbial growth, but you don't want to overly um, attack these natural biomes, because if you have a healthy ecosystem, just like a healthy garden will prevent weeds, a healthy ecosystem will prevent any pathogens coming in. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is how you support the good, path the good bacteria and the good viruses. We don't often hear about good viruses, but um, there's some amazing statistics. There's more bacteria in your body than, than stars in the known universe. And there's more, many more viruses than bacteria and all the bacteria in the world all the bacteria in the world die every second day because of bacteriophages, which are viruses. And these viruses keep the bad bacteria in check. So there's really good viruses in our body and we wanna support them. And one way is to support good microbes. And that's been happening for tens of thousands of years through fermentation. And bacteria and yeast are really powerful allies in your own health. So, and you can brew your own medicine at home. Now, this is, there's not a big industry in this. I mean, kombucha is now a big industry, but the, the companies that make soft drinks and pharmaceutical companies don't want you to make your own medicine. Um, but living ferments have been used as medicine for thousands of years. And what happens with fermentation, you actually activate the nutrients in, um, if we talk about kombucha specifically, you make that with um, tea and sugar. And the fermentation leads to bioactivation of the phytonutrients within the tea and you get enhanced medicinal properties. If you add herbs then, they enhances the, the, uh, and activates the properties of those herbs. So the addition of herbs into a ferment can increase antiviral and immune enhancing properties. But just on its own, uh, a kombucha brew that you can brew at home for pennies um, you know, per litre has gut um, uh, probiotic activity and immune enhancing properties. And there's quite a bit of research now, I've just got one study there, but quite a bit of research shows that the populations with high consumption of fermented foods actually have better outcomes with COVID and that people who suffer from COVID and actually get sick have different microbial activity with less diversity. So you want to enhance your natural garden. You want to be a permaculturalist in your gut and enhance that diversity. And just, I couldn't help putting this slide in. This is using the SCOBY as a honey dressing. So this is my ankle. I, I, damage it in the garden. And if you can see here, this is just a SCOBY put on there and it forms this um, 
you know, natural seal, it, it just adheres on, it forms a really great protective barrier. I put a little bit of um, honey on, underneath that. And that costs, you know, less than a couple of cents to grow your own wound dressings. So, you know, and it provides moist cellulose barrier, anti, naturally antimicrobial, no adhesive, natural, actually soaks off in water. So you can actually grow your own wound dressings, not just growing your own probiotics. Cool. Okay, so that's the first line of defense, your skin and your nasal mucosa. Now we're going to go to the second line of defense and the most basic form of second line of defense in your innate immunity is the ability to raise your body temperature. And um, for the past 600 million years, every insect, fish, reptile, bird, and mammal has evolved ways to raise their body temperature when they have a viral in uh, infection to combat viruses. And there's research on um, historical and anecdotal research, but also epidemiological evidence that shows that regular sauna bathing improves cardiovascular, respiratory, immune function, and the risk of pneumonia and viral infection. And there's randomized controlled trial evidence that shows regular sauna bathing halves the incidence of respiratory viral infections. And that randomized control, control trials also show that humidified air reduces viral shedding and gives symptomatic relief and improves the course of the common cold. And at the start of the pandemic last year, I was talking about heat and how heat can, you know, if, if, oh, if you're scared about um, getting a viral infection, you know, raise your body temperature in the bath and you know, you, you'll boost your immune system. And I was getting trolled on the internet saying, and, and I, I got complaints against me a bit to APRA saying that um, I was spreading dangerous misinformation, which I wasn't. So I actually wrote a peer reviewed paper. It's called Turning Up the Heat on COVID-19. It's open access. You can read that. That's a scientific peer reviewed paper now that summarizes the research on using heat to boost your natural immunity. And humans have always used heat for health and in the forms of hot springs, baths, saunas, hammams, steam rooms, sweat lodges, steam inhalation, hot mud, poultices, and exercise. So, whereas making a fever can raise your body temperature, it, it makes you tired. It takes a lot of metabolic energy to raise your own body temperature but you can outsource that energy to a hot bath or to, you know, to your hot water system or to a sauna and raise your body temperature. And still it'll make you tired because your heart will be pumping more. Um, and we'll talk about some of the effects of, there's lots of different effects that ha happen when you raise your body temperature, but you can actually get the benefits of fever without the metabolic cost and without being sick by outsourcing that to your hot water service. So I'm gonna go quickly for these slides. They're a bit technical, but there are cellular effects of heat stress. And um, just high airway temperature can directly, directly inhibit pathogens. In fact, um, coronaviruses uh, with a, a lipid envelope will, will melt at 55 degrees centigrade. So if you're in a sauna over 55, viruses can't exist there. And in fact, they use 55 degrees in America to sterilize police cars. They heat the interior of the police car up to 55, and then it's considered sterile because viruses are destroyed by that temperature. The acute heat stress, you know, short term, um, improves immune, immune cell differentiation and activation. That, you know, the cells become more active, more fluid. You get more um, TNF alpha responses, more interleukin and more interferon from, from um, T cells. So your natural killer cells, monocytes and T cells are all supercharged with heat. And if you have regular heat stress, and most of the research has been done on saunering, and they say regular heat stress is when you do it most days a week. So that's at least three to four days a week. Um, you, you get reduced adrenaline and cortisol. You get more um, natural killer cell activity, more B cell responses. And the B cell responses is the systemic. That's the, the third line of defense in terms of antibody responses. You also get heat shock proteins, which protect immune cells and proteins from um, heat and cold induced damage and actually reduces blood pressure and builds your vascular resistance, um, which we'll talk about now with the physiological effects of heat stress. So if you... You know, you, when you're in heat stress, you raise your body temperature, which simulates fever. You get more cardiac output with lowered peripheral resistance, which means your periphery is vasodilated, but you, and your heart is beating harder. So it's actually a cardiac workout. So if you've got, if, so if you're overweight or you're you can't exercise, going to a hot bath um, gives you a, a like a really good cardiac workout, and it's really good. There's lots of evidence to show it's really good for cardiac failure in people with heart conditions. Um, the naturally increases blood pressure and um but then afterwards it decreases blood pressure so it's really good for um general heart heart effects it naturally increases blood ph so which is because when you're hot you pant and when you pant you ex excel um exhale ex excess carbon 
dioxide, which slightly raises your pH. You get more anti-inflammatory anti responses. You get more immune activity, which I talked about. You get detoxification from the organs and from the skin, improves vascular function. So you've got 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels in your body that are lined by smooth muscle. And that, that's not under your control. But if you go into the heat, they all relax. And then if you go into cold, they will contract. It's like a bicep curl for your vascular system. And you get increased physiological resistance overall, which is called a hormetic stress response. So it actually builds your ability to cope with other stress. And the effects of heat stress are improved with hydration. You want to stay well hydrated, you know, bathe in beautiful water, but drink lots of beautiful water. And the heat effects of stress um, or the effects of heat stress are increased with when you do it with cold, so contrast bathing, and when you use essential oils with all the different effects the essential oils have. So saunas are a solution um, to wellness and also to viral infections. And there's also psychological benefits of heat stress, which I, I think you can't underestimate, whereas you can't overestimate. So having a focus on fun and positive action. So rather than you know, being at home and saying, oh, the virus is out to get me, I just have to wait, you know, wait at home and there's nothing I can do. There's so much you can do. And having something that's positive that you can actually do for yourself and feel the effects on your body is really positive. And going to the point of forced mindfulness, and I'll talk a bit about that later, but that's the point where your body is talking to your mind and saying, hey, we're all on the same page here, maybe, you know, and you can focus, focus on your sensations and focus on your body. They also, um, saunas enhance relaxation and sleep. And that's been shown across the board. Um, one of my PhD students who's just submitted her PhD, Joy Hussain, she's a medical doctor in Brisbane. Um, we did a big global sauna survey. And the thing that people who take regular saunas say, we sleep better. It also activates the placebo response and the power of positive th thinking and the idea of remembered wellness. And finally, saunas can be a social activity that enhances social connection. So there's, there's so many benefits, psychological benefits of you know, doing regular heat stress. And how do, so how do we bathe to boost immunity? Not everyone has access to a sauna, but you can all bathe to, to create forced mindfulness. And you know, people ask me, okay, what's the, how much do I have to spend? How long? Um, what temperature? How humid? And it's not prescriptive like that. It depends on your own tolerance. So the exposure depends on, on the time, the temperature and the humidity. It also depends on you and it will change day to day. So it, it varies with your experience, how, how often you've done it, with the, with the time of day, the time of um, whether you had a, you know, a good night's sleep, whether you're worried about something, that'll all affect how long you, you can stay in heat. And these benefits that arise from forced mindfulness um, are really profound because you're getting you're becoming at one with your body your body and your mind are on the same page and that is the definition of yoga union getting your body um, and your your mind to be on the same page and it's done through the breath and one of the things that's often not talked about is regaining balance is just as important as the exposure so when you go really hot or if you go hot and cold you want to spend time going into neutral so you're really experiencing the point of perfect temperature and at that point of perfect temperature, it's blissful. It's really enjoyable. And at that point, you can come into stillness and, and again, be in touch with yourself and find that deep inner well of your being. So a standard protocol is to rinse, then hot, cold, rest, repeat. And usually two or three times of repeating. So when you're doing the hot, you're vasodilating. When you're doing the cold, you're vasoconstricting. When you're resting, you're, coming, you're teaching your body how to come back into balance. You're teaching your body how to go into homeostasis. And then you repeat it. And each one, each re repetition is like a bicep curl for your whole vascular system and for your physiology. So the synergistic effects of hot and cold. And in fact, you know, sauna is the only Finnish word in the English language. And in Finland, they take it for granted when you have a sauna, you also go into the cold. So I've already talked a bit about this, this contrast bathing, that the heat shunts the bloody to the periphery, um, shunts the bl blood to the periphery without producing extra metabolic waste products because your muscles and your skin are relaxed, but the blood's flushing through them. So any inflammatory um, markers and any, um, any extra metabolic waste um, get shunted out. And then when you go into the cold, all that blood is forced into your internal organs. It goes into your core and it goes through your liver and your kidneys, which then um, cause a diuresis. So going from hot to cold actually makes you want to pee and enhances elimination of these um, toxic products that you've built up. The heat stress also enhances the immu immune system and um, heat and cold actually enhance each other. 
um, on the effects on the innate immunity. And we've talked about leukocytes and granulocytes, and natural killer cells and interleukin and nor norepinephrine are all enhanced with hot and cold. Um, and these traditional protocols, which alternate hot and cold, really stress the relaxation to regain homeostasis. So I can't stress that enough. If you're doing hot and cold, go to the extremes, but then go back and experience balance. So there, there is some research, and, and when Wim, Ho Wim Hof was in Australia, I actually toured with him and, and gave the lecture for the, um, Wim Hof, um, the science behind the Wim Hof method. And there was a, a study that was inspired by Wim Hof done in Amsterdam, where they wanted to see the effect of a cold shower on flu, um, flu symptoms and sick days. And they got over 3,000 people, and they randomised them. So it was a randomised control trial to either have a hot shower, a cold um, or a cold shower for either 30, 60, or 90 seconds. And it was 10 or 12 degrees, which is, that's pretty cold. That's like Melbourne winter cold, the water in Melbourne winter. And they found after one month that the group that had the cold shower had 29% less sick days after one month. And it didn't matter if it was 30, 60, or 90 seconds. Um, that whole group had pretty much the same reduction, 29% less sick days. And two thirds of them said they'll continue taking, they didn't really enjoy the cold showers, but they continue doing it because they felt great afterwards. So that's, you know, randomized controlled trial showing that you can actually reduce flu and colds just with a cold shower, which you know, doesn't cost any money, just a bit of cold water, or maybe tiny, you know, a few cents. Um, however, the, you know, the powers that be uh, actually suppressing safe treatments. So on the World Health Organization website, right now, it's been there for over a year and I've been talking about it, no one wants to listen. They actually say your normal body temperature remains about 36.5 to 37, regardless of the temperature of your bath or shower. And then actually taking a hot bath with extremely hot water can be harmful as it can burn you. Well, that's a blatant lie. I'm, I'm fact checking the, the fact checkers. This is on their myth busting side on the WHO site. Um, that's, that I consider as dangerous misinformation because it's preventing people using a safe, effective natural therapy. And um, all around the world, saunas are being closed, hydrothermal facilities are being closed, even though they have proven benefits. And even though a virus cannot exist inside a sauna because it's over 55 degrees, yet based on the World Health Organization statements, this has gone out. And they've even you know, trotted out some a few professors who aren't doctors saying, oh yeah, you know, getting using heat to treat a virus, that's silly. Yet it's not. Um, and I published the paper to prove that. And you know, here's proof. Um, this is a this is from the blog post. It's me in the bath pointed at a thermometer. And you can do your own research and anyone with a thermometer and a hot hot bath can expose the brazen lies by the World Health Organization. And my paper, Turning Up the Heat on COVID-19, documents all that evidence that I, I mentioned, showing that raising your body temperature helps overcome viral pathogens. And when used regularly, um, heat treatments not only prevent viral infections, they prevent most chronic disease, and they reduce the risk of dying from all causes. Now, that's profound. Just you know, raising your body temperature three to four days a week can reduce the risk of dying from all causes, heart attack, stroke, um, Alzheimer's disease, you name it. So this is a really profound um, therapy that again, there's no industry behind it. No one makes money out of it, but it's really um, profound that you can do at home with very little cost um, equipment or training. However, before you do your own research and prove that WHO is, is lying, there are some common sense safety I, I have to talk about. And do try this at home, but when you're doing heat, you need to, the five safety principles are drink, take care, tune in, be aware and rest. So we'll break that down. So drink, you wanna stay hydrated with good quality water, preferably beautiful water that's filtered, structured, balanced, blessed and free. So, cause you, your body has to eliminate, you'll have a diuresis, you'll excrete more water. So you, and you can, if you don't drink enough water when you're doing heat, you can get constipated um, you can, and your skin will dry out, but you can, you know, your bowels will dry out and you'll, you'll get constipated. So you wanna keep drinking. You want to take care to avoid dizziness or fainting. If you're, if you're really hot and you stand up quickly, you can get faint because all your blood vessels are open in your legs and all the blood will drain down into your legs and you'll get lightheaded. And you also want to be care, um, careful with you know, heat sources. You don't, you know, oh, spelling error there, but you, you don't want to um, you know, put your hand on the, on the rocks in the sauna. You don't want to put your hand in really boiling water. So it's just common sense. You know? Take care when you're changing posture and take care around hot, hot surfaces. You also want to tune into your own body and use comfort as your guide. So you want to enjoy that idea of forced mindfulness. 
um, induced by the extremes of relaxation, um, by the induced by extremes of temperature, then you also want to in, enjoy the relaxation that's induced by warmth, by the 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 point in between hot and cold. Because somewhere in between hot and cold is perfect, and you want to tune into what is perfect for you in that moment, and that's really blissful. And by doing that, you can balance all your hormones, your cortisol comes down, your thinking comes down. It's like a deep meditation. It's a great time to meditate in between when you've done hot and cold. You also want to be aware because your heat tolerance will vary. It varies between people and it varies in the same person at different times. So you don't want to go beyond being comfortably uncomfortable. So it's okay to be comfortably uncomfortable. You don't want to be uncomfortably uncomfortable. And you want to avoid extremes if you're impaired by drugs or alcohol, because then you're not aware of, of where your limits are. And it's sort of like doing a yoga stretch. When you get to the end of a yoga stretch, there's a point where you, you've stretched far enough and you know if you just breathe and focus, you can be there okay. But if you force yourself to go further, you're going to hurt yourself and limit your flexibility. But if you do that every day, you'll find that you actually increase your flexibility, even though you haven't pushed it, it's just naturally expands by itself. Well, your capacity for hot and cold also naturally can expand by itself. And then finally, you want to rest, which I've talked about. So spend time resting and exploring the bliss of thermal homeostasis and cooling down when hot and warming up when cold. And there's a subtle difference in the bliss. You know, when you're really, um, when you're really hot, that bliss of then cooling down, um, you're getting to that perfect place, but it's different from the um, when you're really cold and then you start to warm up, you know, stand by a fire when you're really warm. So you want to get tune into that bliss and getting bliss from your body. And this thermal homeostasis is a bliss that not, not just you enjoy, but all the bacteria in your body enjoy. Every form of life on earth has to cope with thermal homeostasis. So that's an evolutionary adjustment that all life has to do. And you can tune into that when you're, when you're playing with hot and cold. And finally, the, the cold water hokey pokey is a little dance and, and um, exercise that I've created to make hot, hot and cold showers easier. I'm going to play a little video here if that this works. So I'm going to give you a little exercise, a little ritual. You can hopefully you can hear this. Cold showers comfortable. And that's the cold water hokey pokey. So you start, you start with a really hot shower. In fact, you do it so hot that you're vasodilated and you're feeling really hot. And then the, the hardest thing about a cold shower or even cold water immersion is the decision to do it. So then you actually step back, you turn the hot water off, you turn the cold water on, and you just wet your left foot and leg, then your right foot and leg, then your left hand and arm and your other hand and arm. And what you've done then, you've vasoconstricted your, your periphery and you push all this warm blood into your core. So you're actually feeling good. And then you keep breathing calmly and smile to yourself because that's what it's all about. <laughs> and then you put your left side in, then your right side in, then your front side in and you turn yourself around. Keep breathing. So I'm just going to stop that there because it's going to take all day if we um, do for this presentation. But you can go, in, that's on my website, that's on YouTube, you can see that. So I want to give you a little... Um, but just on that, when you, when you put your left side in, if you take a big breath first and then put your left side in, so you're sighing out as the cold water hits your upper, upper body, instead of going <gasps> and, and doing that, you'll be going, ah. and you'll notice the cold, but it won't be shocking. It'll be quite natural and gentle. So it's a really, really nice thing to, to be able to, to be able to do. And you can do that at home. Doesn't cost any money, doesn't take much time. Um, really effective um, health intervention. And so now I want to talk about is your home making you sick? These are getting the bait, we're still getting the basic things right, remember. And um, uh, Nicole Belsma, who's the founder of the building biology industry in Australia, she's one of my PhD students. And last week, after six years, she submitted her PhD, which is fantastic. And, and working with her over the last six years, I've learned so much about healthy homes. And I want to share you know, a really quickly summary of signs that your, your home may be making you sick. And this is a you know, just really brief summary, but these are you know, five things you can look for. One is a musty odour or visible water damage that will indicate mould. Pests such as cockroaches, rodents, ants, termites, mosquitoes, and flies suggest there's allergens around. Stale air or chemical smells rather than fresh air suggest there's airborne toxicants and allergens. Multiple Wi-Fi signals, cordless devices, poor lighting or poor temperature control. Um, and poor temperature control is actually an also issue with humidity because it dries out your nasal passages. But that's electromagnetic radiation. And, that, and that's a big issue with sleep and, and um, immune system as well. 
and they're looking at the junk, clutter, rubbish, excess dust, and toxic products. There's a whole, uh, and this is a whole, I mean, Nicole's written an amazing book on this. Um, this could be a whole, you know, it's a whole three year full time course to actually study this. But these are some of the things you can obviously look for. Because remember, if you, if you get the basic things right, other things go right. But if you've got these things wrong, no matter what else you do, no matter, no matter how much you spend on medicines and, and therapies, if these are wrong, then you're not going to get well. So this is getting the basic things right. And so, here's, so we're going to get into the protocols now and lifestyle prescriptions. And I've got a whole program, and this is like one slide, which is a whole lecture, and I run a week retreat on this program. But this is talking about expanding your comfort zone, just like you do with hot and cold, but you do it in terms of the five dimensions of, of, of biology, which is water, glucose, oxygen, temperature, and carbon dioxide, and opening up your channels of elimination, which are your bladder, your bowel, your breath, your body, and your brain. And the extreme wellness lifestyle prescription is to filter and flush your bladder, feast and fast your bowel, pant and hold your breath, do hot and cold with your body, and do everything possible so you're in flow, and then don't do anything at all with your brain. So that's just another extreme wellness lifestyle prescription. And I know a lot of you, you know, they're worried about, okay, how do I get ivermectin or what can I do instead of ivermectin? We're going to get to that nutrients. But so that's, but I want you to get the basic things right first, because then no matter what else you do, um, it's not going to be as effective unless these basics are right. So I've created a healthy habit for happy humans. Um, and this is um, your daily wellness protocol. And this came out as a poem, a lot of my, a lot of my um, condensed information. I've got quite a few poems to share. So this is my most recent one. So the daily wellness protocol. So you do the cold water hokey pokey to start your daily protocol. You drink tonics and teas to prevent disease and avoid sugar and alcohol. Uh, eat good food, mostly plants, but only when you're in the mood. Eat leaves, roots, flowers, fruits, fungi and fermented food. Do hot, cold, rest, repeat at least three times a week and connect with friends, emotionally cleanse and relish a good night's sleep. So that's just a daily protocol. Again, simple, simple things you can do to enhance your health. So now we're going to get into some specific things you can do. And um, I'm going to talk about herbs and supplements because that's, um, you know, I'm, I guess I'm really well known for that and the textbooks I write. And one of, one of my favourite um, is Tulsi. Now, Tulsi is holy basil. Uh, and when, when, when we did the first three editions of our textbook, we didn't actually have Tulsi in it. And it's not really widely used by Western herbalists, but in India, it's considered the, the ultimate um, adaptogen, but the, the beyond compare. It's, it's like the herb that's beyond you know, Mother Nature's gift to humanity, the, the queen of herbs. And they say it's like liquid yoga, because if you do Tulsi every day, you do it so you don't get sick. You don't do it to treat illness. You do it every day so you don't get sick in the first place. And Tulsi tea, if you drink it, has all the benefits of sugar, caffeine, and alcohol drinks without the drawback. So Tulsi will relax you without the depressant effects of alcohol. It'll keep you alert without the agitation of coffee or caffeine. It'll balance your energy without the highs and lows of sugar drinks. It has very broad spectrum antimicrobial and antiviral activity. And it's actually traditionally used um, as a herb for coughs and colds and, and flu season. And it's even an effective mouthwash. And, and it's as effective as chlorhexidine, but when you wash with chlorhexidine, you've got to spit it out because it's toxic. But it tells you you can wash your mouth with it, you know, um, get rid of all the bad bacteria in your mouth, and you can swallow it and then improve your liver detoxification and improve your, your overall health with Tulsi. So Tulsi, you can grow it yourself. I've got... Um, and you can see that on my kitchen table, I've always got little Tulsi cuttings. And if you come to my house, I'm going to offer you a Tulsi cutting to take home and grow for yourself. And this is Tulsi is one of the things you can infect yourself and, and others with good health. Because if I give you one of these Tulsi cuttings and after a week, this will have roots on them. And then you can just plant that and you can make your own tree and or own plant. And then you can take a cutting and give it to your friends. So this is infectious health. This is how you, you know, wellness can be contagious. So Tulsi is one of my favorite herbs. I encourage everybody to have that. And in India, every Hindu, um, Hindu household has a Tulsi plant that they actually worship as a deity. They actually come and they eat a, a leaf. And th there's not many plants you can eat from every day of the year and you'll benefit and the plant will benefit. But Tulsi, you can just take the leaves. You can, it's holy basil. You can use it like basil. You make pesto, you can make tea, put it into curries. Um, 
into salads. It's just it's just wonderful. So yeah, I really recommend getting Tulsi. You can get it from um, some nurseries. It's called perennial basil or holy basil. Um, I suggest getting it from a friend and just taking a cutting and growing it from cuttings. So, th so then the next herb that I think is really potent right now is Artemisia annua and Ivermectin. And, and you may not know, but I, Ar Artemisia annua and Ivermectin both shared the Nobel Prize in 2015. And that was the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine and both Artemisia annua and Ivermectin um, equally. So it was William Campbell and Satoshi Amura discovered ivermectin and they they discovered that in soil bacteria um, near a golf course in south um i think it was southwestern japan and um in tokyo um, and it was discovered from soil and they found out it, it was effective against roundworms and now they found out it's, it's so widely effective antiviral anti-parasitic but artemisia annua is being used for thousands of years in chinese medicine as an antiviral anti-parasitic and as um, for treating fevers and most notably, Artemisia annua is really effective for treating malaria. However, it's also really effective against um, spike protein and for blocking spike protein and having spike protein linked to your cells, as is ivermectin. So using Artemisia annua, now ivermectin has been banned in Australia. Artemisia annua is available over the counter. You can actually grow it yourself and you can dry it out. Um, and I've got a little reference and to teach you how to do that yourself. But it, Artemisia annua has been used traditionally to treat fevers, coughs, and colds. And it, it has the same sort of functionality as ivermectin does. But it's available over the counter. So, and Artemisia is available as Artemisia Plus. So there's a company, Interclinical Laboratories, which I don't have an interest in. However, um, I'm friends with the, um, the people who run this company because um, in the early 2000s, I was president of the Integrative Medicine Association for about eight years. So I got to you know, meet all the heads of all the different um, natural medicine companies and you know, got to find out which products I like. And Artemisia Plus is a fantastic product. It's not just, it's not just um, Artemisia, it's got thyme and clove and fennel, and cat's claw. Um, so this is a really good prevention and also a treatment. So if you're taking it for pre prevention, you might just take one or two tablets a day. And then you could double that if you're, if you're actually treating symptoms. So that's a really good preventive. Now, there's also another um, product you can get Artemisia in, and it's in our flu shot. And that's um, a company that I founded last year with a friend of mine who has the Good Brew Kombucha Company. Now, this is not a um, medicine. This is a vinegar, and it's a concentrated vinegar. So we get um, kombucha, and we ferment it all the way through so there's no sugar or alcohol left in it. And then we soak herbs in it and the, we call this one the flu shot or defend blend and we have all the bitter herbs that that naturally treat or have naturally um, been used to treat um, viral infections and artemisia is the main ingredient in that so that's a, a tonic you only need about 10 or 20 mils incredibly bitter and the bitter flavor itself is really potent so bitter flavor will stop sweet cravings bitter flavor will also prepare your liver for digestion and you know in Europe, you know, they have bitters before a meal, you know, digestive bitters, which um, wake up your taste buds and you enjoy your the flavours of your meal better. Your liver will digest better and you won't get as many sweet cravings. So that bitter flavour is really powerful, but it also happens to be really effective against flu virus and blocking spike proteins linking to human cells. And this final um, picture here is a, a fantastic guy, um, Hans Martin, who's he's a pharmacologist, in, um, a German pharmacologist who spent a lot of time in the Congo. And he's got a video here. And it, if, if you sign up on my website, I'll give you the link. Um, there's a link there as well. There's lots of different links I, I can share. But he has got a video, it's about 50 minutes, that teaches you how to grow Artemisia, how to harvest it, how to make tea out of it, and how to use it as a medicine. And um, he quite rightly says, you know, 3,000 people die of malaria every single day. And if Artemisia was more widely um, spread out, 2,800 of those people could be saved every single day. So Artemisia really is a, a wonder herb. That's why it won the Nobel Prize, because um, it's helping to conquer malaria. But it's also, it helps, it has so many other uses. So a fantastic product there, Artemisia Plus. Now also, so, you know, just talking about specific products, and this is something else I've, I've done research in. I wrote a chapter on Dunaliella salina in our textbook um, and talking about carotenoids. And carotenoids are the red, yellow, um, orange pigments in nature. And um, they provide this colorful immune support. And there's a great story about zebra finches. And if you're a zebra finch, you're, um, if you've got a red beak, 
that means you're really sexy and you're going to have you're going to have reproductive success and the redness of your beak depends on how many carotenoids are in your body so it's, that's a way of showing beauty is actually a survival um trait so it's survival of the sexiest so beautiful you know being beautiful is actually necessary for um reproduction and with animals um often the beauty shows their immune immune strength by showing how many carotenoids are in the body and with um these pink flamingos here flamingos are naturally white birds but they feast in these salt lakes and they feast on this red algae called Danaliella salina it's the most salt tolerant life form on earth and it goes red and that, that's what makes the the flamingo is pink and that's what protects them from the sun and um your skin naturally has three pigments it's got the red pigment from hemoglobin it's got the brown pigment from melanin and it's got the, the orange pigment from carotenoids and it's good to have a bit of an orange tinge to your skin because that means you have antioxidant protection from sun damage and it means you've got really good immunity and the carotenoids support not just non-specific uh, immunity they also support specific immunity so carotenoids are really important for maintaining epithelial health and mucosal health. Remember the mucosal in your nose is one of the most important um, regions, you know, to prevent viral infections. So you want to maintain that health. Um, carotenoids enhance white blood cell function and antibody responses. So the antibody responses is the third line of defense. Remember the systemic effect, um, defense. And um, carotenoids in, increase interferon, have anti-tumor and, and specific antiviral activity and actually reduces, um, and specifically with beta carotene, reduce the incidence of viral infections. They also help protect, protect thymus structure and function. And your thymus gland is where your B cells go and get trained up. It's like the boot camp for your, your B cells, which um, make antibodies. And carotenoids are really important for that. And Danielis salina is a red algae. It's sort of like spirulina, but it grows in the ocean in really salty conditions. So that's the most um, salina. It's like it's really tolerant to salt. It's the most um, tolerant, um, salt tolerant life form on Earth. And it's also the highest form of beta carotene on Earth. So that all the all the companies that put beta carotene into their vitamin pills, they usually get it from Danielis salina. Um, so there's a whole lot of other herbs that can combat respiratory infections. Um, the top ones are Artemisia annua, which I've talked about, Andrographis paniculata. That's also called the king of bitters. And that's really widely used in um, Thailand right now for COVID prevention and COVID treatment. Well, whereas Artemisia annua is really widely used in Africa and specifically Madagascar. So the president of Madagascar actually set up a company called COVID Organics, talking about um, having Artemisia annua tea bags. And I think it costs four cents a tea bag and really effective in helping prevent COVID um, just using Artemisia. But Andrographis, as I say, is used in Thailand. Tulsi, I've mentioned, holy basil. But then other herbs traditionally in, in Europe before flu season that have been used, um, Echinacea, Astragalus, horseradish, elderberry, elderflower, and reishi. Now, a lot of these are bitter herbs, and I've talked about that. Now, all of these herbs are actually used in our vinegar. As I say, a vinegar is not a therapeutic good. It's just a vinegar, um, but it's got all these herbs in it. It's got that bitterness. And when you, if, you, if you taste it, you don't have to ask, is it doing something? You'll feel it do something. Um, for some people, it's really like a punch in the face of bitterness. So if, that, if, you, you, know, if you find it's too bitter, you can put it into apple juice, and you'll, you'll experience it. It turns apple juice into grapefruit juice. It tastes like grapefruit juice. That bitterness in grapefruit juice, that's what you're adding. Um, you can put it into mineral water. You can put it into spring water. You can add it to any soft drink. You can add it to any other fruit juice, add it to sweet tea. So all you need is like 20 mils as a dose um, you know, to, to get that flavor and to get that benefit. But there's all of these herbs can also, also be available as dried herbs. You can make them into teas, et cetera. We've just made them into a tonic um, as a food. So gonna get to some specific protocols now. Um, so the, what I call the extreme wellness protocols, and here that's the, the textbook, that's you know, the two volumes, the latest version. Um, and there's many lifestyle-based over-the-counter remedies. Um, so you know, this is, again, basic things, but some more specific things. So certainly beautiful water, our extremely alive Defend blend, and other probiotic beverages. And I would encourage you to grow your own kombucha at home. And, and again, kombucha is one of those things, you'll be making SCOBY, you can give a SCOBY away, and that's a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. And if you give SCOBY to someone, you'll still have yours. They can then grow it up. They can then give it away to other people. And you can infect your whole community with good health. This is how wellness can be contagious. And then for some reason, if your SCOBY dies, then you've got you know, other SCOBYs in your community. You can just ask, can I have some SCOBY back? And you know, it's, it, it makes you really resilient. So having really good beverages. 
Then snacking on seeds and berries and dark chocolate and fermented foods high in zinc and vitamin C and, and bioflavonoids so, and medicinal mushrooms. So they all have antiviral and immune boosting properties. So this is just your general diet and that's delicious. Then you can replace sugar, alcohol and caffeine drinks with Tulsi tea. You can drink Artemisia tea, but it's pretty bitter. It's not, it doesn't taste as good as Tulsi tea and what I call spiky tea. And we know that you know, viruses come into our body through their spike protein and not just coronaviruses. And vaccine injury is caused by spike proteins you know, doing things they shouldn't do, like causing blood, blood clots and affecting our um, endothelium and causing inflammation. And it just so happens the law of signatures, which isn't that scientific, but it happens to be true in herbal medicine, that, um, that you know, things that look the same, like you know, walnut looks like a brain that's good for your brain. And ginseng looks like a little man, it's good for a whole man. And the things that are naturally spiky are good for spike protein. So pine needles, fennel, star anise, which is really spiky, rose hip, which comes from the rose, which is spiky, and reishi, which is spiky. And I've actually got, oh, here's my reishi. This is my reishi mushroom if it's on my kitchen table. Um, you can see how reishi is a bit spiky. And this is just a reishi mushroom. I have it like a bonsai on my kitchen table um, there. So making tea out of, out of spiky things. And right now is a really good time to collect pine needles because in springtime is when all the, the young shoots on the, the pine needles. I think cypress pines are the most flavoursome. I've experimented with a few. You can go and just you know give, give a pine tree a haircut with the, taking the new, new shoots and just infusing that with hot water and making a tea out of it um, can be really effective. Then you also want to have enjoy sunshine. So most days a week, go out into the sun at least 20 minutes. Expose the soft parts of your body to sun. And most days a week, sweat. Get into a hot bath to the point where it's that hot, you have to sort of sit out. And then maybe go outside in the cold air or have a cool shower and then get back in the hot bath. So doing you know, hot and cold most days a week. And then you might consider doing vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, algotene, which is a um, Dunaliella Salina product, which I'll mention. Um, Rosehip, there's a fantastic um, Rosehip product, Rosehip Vital, which I've also done research on in the past and written about and peer-reviewed papers on. But there's a whole range of other nutrients. So these are the general over-the-counter prevention, prevention um, remedies. And then we can get into some more specific stuff. Again, a lot of you know contents in, in my book. And you know, if you want to read 1,600 pages, you can go, you can go in depth about all this. But it, so for early treatment, so if you feel the onset of symptoms or if you feel particularly at risk, you might want to add to the, the general lifestyle practices. You can add more vitamin C, more zinc, more, um, more vitamin D. You can add N-acetylcysteine, which is a precursor for glutathione, which is really important for liver detoxification. You can add, add um, quercetin and other bioflavonoids, which is really high in rosehip and rosehip vital, uh, which I'll mention. You can add Ar Artemisia Plus, which is an Ar that Artemisia product I mentioned. You can add Andrographis paniculata, which is available as tinctures and, and as a tea. Then you can increase your dose of spiky tea and make that yourself. And then um, if you're feeling, if you're still feeling sick or you're getting more sick, that's when you add the medical therapies, which are only available on prescription. And that includes ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, but that's not available in Australia. So if you're in Australia, you don't have access to that anymore. You can add doxycycline, but you can also add inhaled budesonide or inhaled hydrogen peroxide. You can get low flow oxygen at home, but these are all on prescription. But you can add oxygen at home. You can also have high dose um, intravenous vitamin C. And that can be done at home if the doctor's willing, or you can do that in the hospital if the hospital is willing and you have a doctor willing. But these are really um, effective protocols if, if you're starting to feel sick. And here are some of the products I mentioned. So there are many natural over-the-counter products that support immune health. So the TGA limits the claims that can be made about their use. Um, certainly vitamin C, D and zinc are very widely available, but these other herbal products um, change depending on how they're grown and how they're processed. So the ones I know and have experience with are algotene, which is just a red algae product. It's a bit salty. It's like a spirulina tablet. I actually like to break open the tablets and use it on pumpkin soup and use it like a salt. It's like a seaweedy salt, but you can just take that. If you take too many algotene, you'll turn orange by having too much carrot juice, but it's not dangerous. You'll just get an orange tinge, a healthy orange tinge to your skin if you have that regularly. But that's that's the, the beta carotene immune boosting. The Artemisia Plus has all the herbal um, extracts of Artemisia and cat's claw and thyme, etc. Rosehip Vital is a um, pure rosehip um, organically grown in Denmark and they've, they've got really great quality control. So they get the, when these galactolipids um, and people actually use that for arthritis pain. And if you go to their website, I think I'm on 
today, tonight, from 10 years ago, talking about arthritis pain. But rosehip is just great for um, quercetin and bioflavonoids and luteolin. So that's a great product. And um, our extremely alive flu shot, um, which has all these herbs within it uh, as a food. So there's some um, strategies, but however, I want to talk about mindset, which is probably the most important. And you know, a lot of people are panicking. You know, there's a global pandemic. You know, they're scared of getting sick, and there's a totalitarian future. All our rights and and privileges are you know um, being taken away from us. You know, what are we going to do about it? And it's freaking people out. And I must say, if you're not anxious at the moment, then you're not really in tune with what's going on in the world. Um, but you don't have to act from that anxiety. So I want to give you some tips, practical solutions to keep you calm and, and boost your immune system there. And your fight and flight response is the sympathetic nervous system. And that's opposed by the rest and digest response. And they're both really useful. But if you're scared, you invoke the fight or flight response. And that, that's useful because it focuses your attention on external threats. So you can act instinctively and you can either fight a battle or run for your life. And in doing that by focusing on external threats, it suppresses your innate immunity. So actually you get immune suppression from fear and from, from that fight and flight response. You also suppresses your healing responses and it suppresses your rational thought because you don't want to spend time you know, weighing up thought when you, you're in the middle of a battle or running for your life. You want to act instinctively. So it actually shuts down your thinking process, shuts down your immunity and your healing um, if you're in constant um, fear. So that, that's a good thing because it prevents you wasting time if you're in a battle or running for your life. But it's a bad thing if it's constant. And constant fear and anxiety makes you much more vulnerable to physical and mental illness and much more likely to make bad decisions and succumb to manipulation and control from people who want to manipulate or control you. So, you know, it's really important to balance um, fight and flight fear responses with rest and digest relaxation responses. And um, for every negative thought you can have, know that there's an equally valid and equally powerful positive thought that you can have. You just have to find it. And you know, the story about the wolf, you know, there are two wolves battling. Um, you know, which one wins? Well, the one that you feed. So please don't feed the fears. You know, which wolf will you feed? You know, the, the, the good wolf or the bad wolf? You know, it's your choice. It's your choice where you can focus your attention. And I've written about this in my books. You know, these aren't just children's books. These are quite profound books for adults. They're in a, available in an electronic format and beautiful uh, copy formats. I don't look, I'll get them out. But in one phrase in Bing and Bang Begin, and Bing and Bang Begin is actually all written in poetry, but it says in one phrase, it says, thinking can imagine whatever goes on, something can be right or something can be wrong. And wherever thinking's attention span goes, things are created, energy flows. So wherever you put your attention, that's where energy will flow. So if you put your attention on positive things, that's where your energy can flow towards positive things. And so what are the, how do you do that when the whole world seems to be out to get you? And this is what I wanna try and help you with right now. So I was putting, you know, again, ideas of how to combat fear and came up with another poem. So this is the antidote to fear. Foster love, foster love of poetry, express yourself through dance. Fill your life with fun and joy friendship and romance focus on the things you want be the change you want to see spread goodwill to all you meet live fearless and free so focusing on the things you want and being the change and spreading goodwill don't spread fear spread goodwill um, that actually will transform how you see the world and you know wellness and illness are on two ends of the spectrum um, and fear is about blockage, it's about entropy and isolation, um, masking, censorship, distancing, isolation, quarantines, track and tracing, passports, all about fear, and they're all about blocking, blocking flow. Love is about flow, it's about connection, open debate, close contacts, community, privacy and freedom. Um, and they're opposed. So you can, which one are you going to focus on? It's up to you, which wolf are you going to feed? Now, at the start of the pandemic last year, again, because I've, I've had, you know, 40 years, 38 years at uni, but 40 years studying natural medicine, um, I was putting together all the things you could do at home that will boost immunity and relieve anxiety that you can do at home during lockdown with very little cost, training or equipment. And they all had to have research behind it. And if you go to my website, you can click on each of these activities and there's 50 activities in this poem. You can click on each activity and you can get, get, get a link to the research that supports it. So I call this poem, The Whirl of Wellness. 
and it's how to go from wired and tired to chilled and fulfilled, or how to go from stressed and depressed to joyfully blessed. So the world of wellness, these are things you can do at home, very little cost, training or equipment. Hold someone's hand, gaze into their eyes. Walk barefoot in nature, bask in sunrise. Choose a dance partner and go find your groove. Do Tai Chi or yoga, mindfully move. Share a massage, enjoy healing touch. Focus on one thing and don't think too much. Make time for a hobby, play chess, fly a kite. Make use of your hands, draw paint, sew or write. Help someone in need, donate to a cause. Play games, meditate, read stuff from bookstores. Turn off your screens, get a good sleep. Declutter, spark joy, love what you keep. Dig around in a garden, pick up a guitar. Slip into a bathtub, sauna or spa. Care for a pet, take up a sport. Go on vacation and make your home a resort. Lie in a hammock and relieve pent up stress. Relax and do nothing and then do even less. Laugh out loud, share a joke, give someone a kiss, say a prayer, chant a mantra and follow your bliss. So it's again, very simple. And the world of wellness will reduce your anxiety and, and improve your immunity. But what happens if you're in the moment, if you're scared? And I actually came up with this one. These, these are 10 things you can do with your body to relax on demand. I call this emotional first aid. Um, and anytime you're scared, anxious, upset, or in pain, you can do these physical activities um, to bring yourself back and calm yourself down. Because these are all activities that you do with parasympathetic nervous system. So it's touch all your fingers, wiggle your toes, soften your stomach, breathe through your nose. Sigh, smile, swallow, sing. Flutter your eyelids and focus within. And I want to share this little video that was made. So touch all your fingers, Oh, yeah, 10 hacks to relax, super easy. Okay, we're nearly finished and we go to questions, but um, accessing the peace within, this is what you need to do. So if you're in fear and fight and flight mode, you can't think straight. You think straight when you access the peace within and you need to do what you know to be right. So if you act out of fear, that lets you be forced or coerced into doing things that are against your better judgment. Whereas when you're at peace with yourself, you can access your inner superpowers and then your common sense and your inner wisdom naturally guide your actions. And when you do what you know to be right, your actions flow naturally and authentically from the deep inner well of your being. And you don't have to second guess yourself. It's just obvious what is right. And wellness can be just as contagious as illness. So by you doing what's right, you can infect others with good health because both fear and courage are contagious. But fear breeds when you're isolated and alone. Courage breeds in community. So the fact that we're all isolated and alone and locked down, that's actually breeding fear. And the mainstream media can just talk to all us all and tell us how bad the world is and we get scared. To, to counteract that, we need to be in community. We need to, we need to um, foster courage in ourselves and, and then share that with others. And you inspire others whenever you act fearlessly and stand your ground and maintain your own personal sovereignty. That's the most important thing you can do at this time. And there'll, there'll always be things that come up that, that threaten that. And that's when you can use the hacks to relax 
and calm yourself down and then try and be courageous. So, you know, waking up to wellness, you know, I've got these poetic prescriptions for health. We talked about the recipe for wellness. So follow the recipe for wellness, take the antidote to fear, stay chilled and fulfilled with the world of wellness, relax on demand for the 10 hacks to relax, do the cold water hokey pokey and read the beautiful mare and, and bing and bang begin and maintain an attitude of gratitude and positive action. And I've got a whole lot of resources on my website. I do have a, um, a pandemic survival guide with um, this presentation with a lot of other links that I'm trying to get graphic design. So if you go into my website and, and just put your email in, um, that'll be sent to you in the next few days once that's done. And um, I just thought I'd finish just in a few minutes until we get the questions. This is a song of the world of wellness. document I think with some questions I'm supposed to be looking yes. at yeah do you want to have a look at that um hi everyone I couldn't look at it when I, I couldn't look at it when I was screen sharing <laughs> oh, no it was, very, it was very catchy um thank you so much Dr Mark it was amazing as always you're always a beacon of hope and positivity I'm sure everyone felt that there's been some fabulous comments and encouragement positive feedback coming through so um yeah so very much appreciated so I've just, I can see webinar questions now. So yeah, go for it. We can just start going through that. Okay, ivermectin and other treatments. What would you do if we contract COVID now that we have more limited options with ivermectin? So if you contract COVID, get the get the basics right. So make sure you know you don't have mold in your house and you know you're not sick for other reasons. Um, but in terms of you know what treatment, I, I would ramp up the prevention preventive treatment so i would go what i would do i would go on artemisia plus i would go on algotine i would take rosehip i would take the flu shot i would 
be taking vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc. Um, I then might take N-acetylcysteine, um, um, extra quercetin. Um, and then you know, if, you, if you're on all that, chances are you're going to be totally fine. But then if you deteriorated more, then you escalate it up and get a doctor involved. But all of those things I've just mentioned, and I'd also, I'd also um, if you weren't, if you're, if you're sick, if you're, if you're feverish um, and sick, you don't go into a hot, hot bath or sauna. But if you're feeling a bit chilly and often you might find your nose gets a bit cold, to go into a, a hot bath or even just inhale um, steam can be also really effective. These are these are sort of old wives' tales, old, old grandmothers' remedies. But you know, they, old grandmothers became old for a reason. They, they knew what what works. Um, so yeah, that's if you if you get sick, there's a whole range of things you can do rather than just sitting at home in isolation waiting to go to hospital. Um, so can we obtain ivermectin anyway at all? Um, I don't know. That's a political question. So I ivermectin ban is a political thing. It's not about health. Um, I've just heard in, in El, El Salvador now, everyone in the whole country has been given a pack with vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, and ivermectin. Amazing. And here it's banned. Um, so there's questions here, you know, about is equine, you know, the paste used for um, horses safe for human consumption? I don't know. Um, quite, quite possibly. I know Rosehip Vital do amazing Rosehips. They also have a, an animal range for horses and for, for um, dogs. And um, it's the same product for horses and, and, and for animals and for humans, but that's with rose hips because um, rose hips is rose hips. It's not an animal version or a human version. There's really high quality product. With ivermectin, I'm not a pharmacist. I don't know. Um, quercetin and zinc can, are suitable for young children. Um, doses, you know, depending on the child, I, I mean, it's really hard for me to give doses as a general in a general webinar because it really does depend on on your body weight, on your condition, what's going on, um, and also depends on the formulation that you're having. So there's different forms of zinc. Um, but can you take artemisia and ivermectin at the same time? You probably can. Um, I, I haven't seen any studies on that. There are studies on. Um, Artemisia or, or through Africa um, in vitro. They haven't done the big clinical trials yet because um, you know the African countries don't have the money to do that. And um, there's a lot of pressure on the, the heads of state in Africa to not use Artemisia. And in fact, I think there's at least four heads of state in Africa, one in Haiti have been um, died under mysterious circumstances over the last eight months. And I know the, the president of Madagascar who has been promoting um, Artemisia, he just survived an assassination attempt. So there's lots of sort of skullduggery happening in the background. Um, seen someone simmering grapefruit and lemon skin for three hours to make natural hydroxychloroquine. Does this sound right? Well, I don't know about natural hydroxychloroquine, but often the, uh, the bitter elements. So grapefruit is, you know, has bitter, you know, lemons are more sour than bitter, but grapefruits, um, chloroquine, you know, quinine in, in um, um, tonic water. Um, which is what's, what's in hydroxychloroquine and Plaquenil, um, the drug, and Artemisia, and, and things like horseradish and all the stuff we put in our flu shot, these are all really bitter. And there's something in the bitter element that um, helps our bodies um, protect against viral, in, viral invaders. So I don't know about making grapefruit at home. I, I've been making um, pine needle tea at home, and that's just great. I just go to the cypress trees and I do a trim. I boil up the star anise, and there's a difference between decoctions and infusions. So a de decoction is when you boil something up, and star anise is quite woody, so you need to pound it up a bit, and you can boil that up for you know, 15 or 20 minutes. And then, um, and actually have researched this, there's papers on how to extract the, the um the nutrients out of pine needles and it's better just done with hot water you don't need to boil the needles just need to steep them in hot water for 15 or 20 minutes and 80 degrees is you know is enough and then you'll actually see the pine needles will change color and I actually, i've got some over in my kitchen but um that's probably another whole presentation about how to make pine you know, spike what i call spiky tea and then you put you know all the spiky things you know rosehip and pine needles and star anise and um yeah things that enhance immunity but making tea and just drinking that is really great now we're actually coming out of flu season now in Australia. We know we're in our springtime, so there's actually different um, emphasis because our noses aren't going to be so cold anymore. In wintertime, your nose becomes the coldest part of your body, and that's where the virus can invade because your mucus dries out, the little cracks between the cells open up, and then viruses can invade in. Um, in terms of getting ivermectin, well, you know that's that's not my expert. I'm, I'm an expert on wellness. Um, and herbal medicine and um, lifestyle. That's my expertise. In terms of 
you know, I'm, I'm a doctor and I can I prescribe and I had been prescribing ivermectin to patients. Um, I can't do that anymore, um, but I now refer patients, you know, to a whole range of different treatments depending on what they need. Um, TGA bans, this is all politics, which I'm, I'm not, actually, I'm not allowed to talk about this as a doctor. So there's a lot of stuff I can't actually talk about and hopefully I haven't exceeded my, um, you know, ambit here just in this presentation um, that the TGA or the APRA aren't going to come down at me. APRA already came down at me once just for talking about heat and talking about how the World Health Organization is lying about heat. So I got investigated by APRA, someone made a complaint and, um, you know, my medical defense said, you know, take down the website and stuff. And I didn't, I, I just wrote back to APRA and said, I stand by everything I've said, here's the research, a lot of the research I've done myself. And um, they said, okay, we're not going to do anything and they're not going to take it further. Um, and there, are, there is quite a lot of legal action now um, against the TGA and against the Australian government for over, vastly overstepping their reach, but I can't really comment on that. Um, vitamin C, what form of vitamin C? Um, again, there's so many different forms. Um, if you're really, if you, you know, if you're you know, just doing it for prevention, you know, one or 2,000 milligrams, but if you're doing it to treat, you can take what the naturopaths call vitamin C to bowel tolerance, which means you're taking oral vitamin C until you get the runs, until it goes through you. Then you know you've really topped up your vitamin C stores. And then you can actually take intravenous vitamin C and 30 to 60 grams of vitamin C can be taken intravenously. And um, you know, the last 30 years I've been you know, working with doctors, you know, doctors like Ian Brighthove and um, Ian Detman who runs biological therapies. And they've got a vast experience of giving really high dose intravenous vitamin C and seeing patients turn around within you know, eight to 12 hours after high dose vitamin C. So there are very effective treatments. Um, perhaps the most um, important thing is making sure your vitamin D levels are adequate. So you can take, you know, taking regular vitamin D, I think is a really great prevention strategy as well as getting out into the sun. Um, you don't want to get sunburned, but using getting the soft parts of your body out into the sun, but vitamin D is probably something we should all be taking. Um, is quercetin good to help decrease the chance of COVID or help with immune support for recovery? I think both. And in fact, a lot of these things that I've talked about, in fact, probably all of the things I've talked about will not just help prevent COVID, they'll also help treat COVID, and they'll also help treat and prevent vaccine injury, whether you've been exposed to the vaccine yourself. Actually, I shouldn't say vaccine, the experimental gene therapy. If you've been exposed to experimental gene therapy and you're, you're getting spike protein in your own body, or if you're exposed to other people who've had experimental gene therapy and they're shedding um, spike protein on you, these treatments will work the same because often these treatments, they support your own immunity and support your own health, but they also prevent spike proteins binding to your own cells and causing damage. Um, can breastfeeding women use this supplement? Um, quercetin, um, as a straight quercetin, you can, but I, even though I wrote the textbook on herbs and supplements, I'm not a big fan of taking pills. So I'd much rather have my quercetin in a rose hip um, that's just you know organically grown, um, milled at the right at the very right time. So it's really um, high potency and there's not just quercetin in that, there's luteolin and epicacin and, and heaps of and, um, these um, um, lipids, these um, you know, whole range of phytochemicals. So it's not just a single nutrient. And I think it's, you know, it's much better to take your nutrients in a combined form as a prevention. Now, if, if you've got a very specific goal, you can certainly, you know, take 30 grams um, in, a, in a bolus IV, but as a general, general thing, and certainly if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, it's much more gentler and more appropriate to take nutrients in a whole plant form. How much vitamin C is enough for maintenance? Um, again, depending on your diet and who you are and where you are, um, you know, one to two grams a day is, is probably good, depending on the form of vitamin C. Um, but, you know, nature provides the answers. Like in winter, citrus comes into, um, into fruit. So that's the time when we should be eating citrus. And I've been making, um, and it's not just the citrus, the vitamin C in the citrus, in the rind and in the pith, there are really great nutrients, all limonene and all these great um, um, volatiles. And I've been making, um, um, in a dehydrator, I cut up oranges and just get the rind, the whole orange. So I juice the orange and I use the rind, cut it up really fine, dehydrated, and then dip it into dark chocolate. I have these dark chocolate cho orange rind, where I make, um, Stephanie Alexander has an amazing um, flourless chocolate cake. Uh, no, not chocolate cake, orange almond cake. Um, and I just replace the eggs with soaked chia seeds and make that into pudding. So you boil up some oranges and you add some almond meal and then you put in some um, soaked chia seeds and then 
I put some pomegranate molasses and a bit of sugar and you just, you just mash all that up together and you, you're eating the whole oranges and you know it's it's just delicious but it's also you know you, you're dosing up all these phytonutrients well oh, questions about vaccination i don't know i think that's a whole nother topic for another day um and i know there's gonna be a whole topic on that vac vaccination skin and nasal passengers what are the best natural ways to clear your nasal passages daily massage on the face well um neti pot is fantastic so neti pot is a, like a yoga practice but you're just getting um saline water normal saline but you can make your own normal saline with warm water like a cup of warm water with maybe half a teaspoon of salt and you mix that up and the reason why you put salt in it is so it's got the same osmolarity as your body so it doesn't sting so it's the same water you'd use for your washing your contact lenses and you just pour that into a nostril and you pour it into the other nostril and just hold it there until it flows all the way through this is really great for cleaning out your sinuses I, don't, I mean, if you've got really bad sinuses, you might want to do that every day. But I think if you just keep your air nice and humid, and if you're having, you know, hot bath, if you're in the hot bath, you're getting humid air. If you're drinking lots of tea, you know, just the act of having tea, you know, you get the humidity from the tea. Um, you know, that that also all helps to clean out your nasal passages. However, if you're in if you're in a big city with lots of pollution, you know, that top layer of mucus is going to get overloaded with diesel exhaust and all sorts of stuff. So you might may want to help it along. And you want to keep that bottom layer of mucus nice and watery so the cilia can move that along at one millimeter a minute and get that stuff out of there. Um, so yeah, supporting your nasal passages is one of the really important things you can do to prevent viral infections because that's usually where the, where the respiratory viruses will get in. Um, some measures in place today seem to affect skin in a big way. Masks and alcohol sanitizer. Yeah, they do. Um, I would I would try and prevent masks and, and, and alcohol sanitizer. Um, alcohol sanitizer is actually it's, its own toxicity and you're stripping away all your natural oils and your nat natural protective barrier. And as I say, you, you have you know millions of years of evolution that have developed your nasal passages to, to do what they need to do and not just um, prevent entry of viruses, but then show new viruses to your body and train your systemic immune system. So yeah, um, you know, I, I'm really big into you know, supporting your own natural body to do what's designed to do. Um, what's your opinion of nasal swabs used for COVID testing? Um, I don't like them at all. Um, I would prefer not to do them and I, I've not done them myself. So I haven't got any personal experience. I'm gonna try and avoid that as much as I can. What about hay fever sufferers? Mucous membranes are quite vulnerable. Yes. So if you're a hay fever sufferer, you might be overproducing that 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 um, you know, uh, liquid mucus. So you, you know you, you're dripping. Um, so you really want to support your um, nasal mucosa, and you know, there are herbs that can help pre um, prevent that. Um, there's a whole a whole range of nutrients, but again, start with the basics. So you know, go back to basics. You know, good water, good food. Um, good humidity, you know, healthy home, M mold. If you're if you've got allergy, hay fever, any of those issues, then I'd really look around the home. Do you have any water damage? Is there a musty odor? Is there mold behind a wall or something you can't actually see? And you know, because because if if you don't get rid of mold, then no matter how much drugs or other therapies you're going to throw at it, you're not going to get better. What do I think of salt rooms for asthma and allergy sufferers? Um, they, I've been in salt rooms. I, I like them myself. Um, they're not that accessible. It's hard hard to find a salt room and, and go to it. But yeah, they can be very effective. Please discuss if nasal, nasal sprays are effective. Better than to clear virus from nose or throat gargle. Um, as a throat gargle, I much prefer um, Tulsi, Tulsi tea. In fact, I mean, this is Tulsi tea here, but it's actually gone cold now because I've been too busy. It's still delicious. It's cold. but um, And there's research. And it's in, in my textbook. You know, I wrote that the chapter on Tulsi is like 10,000 words with 300 references. I think there's about half a dozen references on using Tulsi for a mouthwash. Um, so I'd much prefer that to Betadine. Um, in nasal sprays, um, I think just normal saline is the best. So you just, you know, you can make up your own saline. You can, I mean, you can buy it, you know, from, they, they make, you know, package, you know packaged um, nasal sprays with um, normal saline. Um, but that's, yeah, I think that's just, <laughs> just salt water in a, in a package but yeah i think normal saline is, is the best sort of nasal spray i don't know if you're if you're sick if you've got a specific infection then maybe adding a few drops of betadine betadine is probably better than any other sort of um drug or additive to use oh wow there's, there's so many questions here <laughs> i don't think we're going to get through them all um saunas and cold, i'll just skip to saunas and cold showers would you use an infrared sauna if you had the covid virus sure 
Um, I have an infrared sauna. I also have a Finnish sauna. So I'm really lucky I've got two at home. My lockdown project last year was building a Finnish sauna in my garden. Um, and if you've got the COVID virus, it doesn't necessarily mean you're sick. And certainly sweating it out and increasing your body temperature will raise your um, immune system and activate your natural killer cells and all that stuff that I talked about. So yeah, is a wet sauna better than a dry sauna? Um, depends what you prefer. It's not, anything that will get you sweating and get you to that point of forced mindfulness and being comfortably uncomfortable. That's what you want. Um, I prefer the wet sauna. And although what I do with my own sauna, um, I start it dry. So I should go in and it's hot, you know, at 70, 80 degrees. And um, you know, I go in it when it's dry. I wait till I crack, which means I start to sweat and I, I sweat till I drip. And then I go outside and I'll cool down and Unfortunately, I've got a swimming pool and it's really freezing at the moment. So I jump in the pool and it's really cold. And then I, you know, I'll rest. And then I'll go back into the second round of heat. And then that's when I'll put the steam on and add steam. Um, it depends on, um, you know, water will transmit heat 25 times more effectively than air, which means if you have steam in the air, um, the heat is much more transferred to your body and you can't tolerate as much. So if, you know, at 48 degrees, a steam room is as hot as you can bear. But I've been in dry saunas that have been 110 degrees um, if, it, if the air is really dry. That was in Europe. So it really depends on the humidity. Um, but what is more comfortable for you? A lot of people like infrared saunas better because you can sweat at a lower temperature and it's more comfortable. Um, I've done a couple of big, quite long podcasts with um, Sebastian from Clear Light Saunas. They're on my website under podcasts. So we do a deep dive into saunas and sauna protocols. So you can have a look at that. Uh, but the cold shower idea would be the same as having a swim in a wetsuit when the water's about 15 to 16. The water does come into a wetsuit and it's on your face. And sure, like um, they, they say with cold water immersion, below about 14, 12 to 14 is what you want to try and get to. Um, and cold water swimming is, is, is fabulous, not just for um, improving immunity. It's great for depression. It's great for chronic pain musculoskeletal pain specifically and all around the world there are clubs of people who who swim in the ocean you know, 20 you know, 365 days a year you know all the way through winter and these people claim that you know they don't get cold you know, colds and flus you know they, they, they stay really strong and often it's a really you know they socially support each other so if you can find go with a group of friends and start swimming in the bay what you'll find though is when you're doing cold water swimming your body adapts quite quickly so like we're just on the, you know, we're in spring now. Um, so I can tell that the tap water in my shower is starting to get warm. So I don't get the same, you know, real chill that I used to get, you know, a month or two ago when we we're in the middle of winter. And then you'll find, okay, it's not cold enough. So then you might start, okay, how can I make some ice? Can I make some big blocks of ice in my freezer and put that in the bathtub and actually do an ice, ice bath immersion? And if you start doing ice baths, you'll find, you know, the first couple of times, maybe one or two minutes is fine. Although most people can handle two minutes, but then after you know a, a few days or a week, you'll start to spend more and more time because your body will adapt quite quickly. So yeah, um, you know our bodies are amazingly ad adaptable to temperature, but that going to the point of being comfortably uncomfortable is what you want. It's not about the time or the humidity or the temperature. It's about what your tolerance is and being in touch with your body, experiencing that tolerance and expanding your resilience and your physiological range. Any advice where to get a non prohibitively expensive infrared sauna with low EMFs in Tassie? Um, I don't know, maybe secondhand. <laughs> Look at um, Gumtree. I mean, you sort of get what you pay for often with saunas. Um, I'd encourage you to build your own if you're in Tassie. It's not, I mean, I've, I've built my own steam rooms on a riverbank with um, some paddles and a tarp when I've been rafting. Um, doesn't, it's not that hard to build your own steam room, um, depending on what you've got, and even a fire bath outside. Um, and it's, you know, fire bars outside, it can be fantastic. My, some of my best fire bath experiences have been in Tasmania. And you can be under the stars and, you know, get, and even though it's really cold in the air, you can get to the point where you're, you know, you're so hot, you've got to go out and, and rest and you can do it in, you know, in and out. So um, doing that hot and cold is really effective. Can you raise your body temperature in the shower as well? You can, but you don't get the same effect as the immersion. So it takes a lot longer in a shower because your whole body is not immersed in the shower. So you're not as in contact with the heat. And you, you get heat transferred by conduction, convection, and radiation. And with water, it's mostly conduction because water conducts heat 25 times more than air. With the shower, you get convection as well because it's moving. 
And you also find in a sauna, actually, if there's steam in the sauna, if you have a fan, you can get convection as well and really blast yourself with heat by fanning the hot air on you. Um, just as you can in cold, if you're in, in a really cold lake or something, or in a cold swimming pool or an ice bath, if you move the water around, it's much, much colder than if the water is still because of that convection effect. Um, so yeah, you can use a shower to raise your body temperature. Um, you won't get as hot, you won't, you're not gonna get to the point of sweating as easily in a shower, but you'll still get the benefit of the hot and cold by the vasodilation and the vasoconstriction. So that's it's in a shower, you know, and it only takes like the, if you do the cold water hokey pokey, it takes like a minute, um, and you'll find you know some days you don't feel like it. But if you just start with your left foot and then you do your right foot and then your arm, you'll you'll find that once you're in it, and especially if you do the big breath in before you put your left side in, and just sigh out before you immerse yourself in the cold water, you sort of it becomes quite easy, and and you know you really enjoy it. So. Yeah, showers are really great, hot and cold showers, but you won't get the same heat effect. Now I know we've been we're going another hour, and, we've been going an hour and a half now. Um, there's way too many questions for me to answer. Um, perhaps we can do another um, webinar. This is what I suggested to um, Autumn and, and Rachel that we can go through these questions and maybe even do another webinar addressing some of these questions. I just um, posted in the chat actually, Mark, because um, I realised there's even more questions coming through now that we'll copy over. Um, I mean, there's so much more um, opportunity to go so much deeper on all of this and get all these questions answered. So I said, we'll invite you back for a specific Q&A Q session to, to further this along. Yeah, so, so, so you know, um, what I tried to do today is really just give you the foundation. So these are the, just the basics of health. And, and as I, I started off quoting or paraphrasing Bill Mollison, when you get the basic things right, other things can go right by themselves. But if those basic things are wrong, it's so hard to play catch up because if you know if you've got these basic things wrong and you've got bad diet or you've got mold in your house or or you've got you know bad water and um bad you know, it, it, no matter what else you throw at it you know you can spend heaps of money on vitamins and supplements but you're just wasting your money um so yeah today was trying to get the basics i have i have created a guide i call it the pandemic survival guide um so if people put their name on my website and give me their email address i will send that out to um everybody that i um that I can, as I say, tragically, my graphic designer's husband is in hospital after um, you know, fitting after having her having the jab. But um, yeah, so that will happen hopefully in the next week or so. Um, I'll get that guide out to people, and that can be a resource because it's got a lot of links and live links to different products and different other um, information sources. Um, and hopefully after today, I'll keep my medical license because you know, I don't know if I've broken, the TGA comes up with all these new laws and APRA brings up these new laws and I've already been investigated for you know, talking about heat and saying that you can actually prevent heat and can, uh, you can prevent COVID and you can actually boost your immune system. They don't, like, they don't like you saying that because they want you to be scared and they want you to be isolated because fear breeds in isolation. So um, you know, the more you can create a community and thank you Autumn for making this, you know, creating a health rights alliance community and um you know stay together people um even though you might be isolated at home you know boost each other up and the more you can be fearless and you know in touch with your own inner well of your being the more you can allow others to do the same and that's really potent so thank you everybody thank um you. Thank I'm, you I'm gonna actually have, I'm, hopefully is there any way i can grab the chat and have a look yes i can through. save it and um send it through to you because there's been some lovely right. uplifting comments here um, I haven't been able to chat, obviously, while yeah, I'm Yeah, ab absolutely. Like well, you know, in the event that the TGA ever come after you, Mark, we thank you for your bravery and we will be right behind you to fight it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, not, I'm not a big fighter. I've always, you know, I follow the, you know, the, the antidote to fear. So rather than fighting what I don't want, I'd much rather work to what I do want. And what I want is everyone to be well. And because, you know, there's a, there's a great saying that, you know, pain when you share pain it decreases when you sh share joy it increases so i'm all about sharing joy but also sharing other people's pain and reducing that so i want everybody to be well because that makes me um well and creates a whole resilient community around me and that's what i'm hoping that will create worldwide wellness and then our security is will be ensured not because of you know vaccine passports and vaccines but it'll be assured because everyone's healthy and prosperous so they won't want to rob you because they're healthy and they, you know, and they're, they're rich. And if we make a rich, prosperous world, if we have worldwide wellness, um, then that is the solution to all our ills. And um, 
it starts with the basics. There's a, there's a lot of focus both on you know the narrative with COVID going on right now and also from an activist perspective on the political changes. There's a lot of focus on the negative and the things that we're afraid of. We need to start switching that to the solutions and the positives and getting our mindset right because this is going to go That's on for it. a while. <laughs> But the, and, and hopefully, hopefully it won't. Hopefully, you know, soon, you know, the dark forces that are sort of trying to control us are going to get taken down. And can you imagine a world where it's like you know, it's like we've all been living without someone's throat on our uh, someone's foot on our throat, um, for and for like generations, not just you know months, like literally for generations, we've had you know, powers you know controlling us. And imagine a world when that's that pressure is released and you know we can really create heaven on earth and um, I want to do a whole series on how to turn your home into a health retreat um, I've already got a, a course on, on my website um, on the extreme wellness academy called waking up to wellness which goes into much deeper dive and some of them this was like a this presentation was like a summary of sort of my you know a lot of stuff that I go into a lot deeper with um, so really love to share all that and, and hopefully I'll be writing more but this guide that I'm producing. It's going to be a living document. I'm probably going to keep on updating that, um, but that really provides the basics. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead Beautiful. and toss you team now. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Mark. We uh, look forward to having you back soon. And as I've mentioned in the chat a few times, um, we will put those questions out to some of our other doctors if they're not uh, specific questions that are probably for Dr. Mark's niche something specifically on vaccination you know we have a big network of doctors who are linked into us but uh, as you can probably appreciate these doctors are really under the microscope at the moment um and as as some of you most of you would probably know a lot of doctors are being censored and bullied um from tga and upra uh to not speak out against the vaccine so perhaps those kinds of questions uh we will be getting answered next week by possibly a retired doctor we haven't quite figured out who will be doing that yet but we're going to get that organized um and anything that is too controversial for on air we will um get answered anonymously through our network of doctors um and, and just a little just to let people know, I mean, I am still a doctor, so I'm still doing telehealth consultations, but I don't have a lot of, um, you know, um, booking booking availability. But people can book through my website. Yes, if they, I've if also they been putting that in the chat, um, along with your uh, uh, the website to sign up at to get your um, your little survival guide that you're going to put out in well whenever whenever you can given the circumstances i've just put that in the chat again if anyone wants to draw your attention to that um yeah. and we will call mark you today. Today. Yeah. yeah wonderful to have you mark and thank you so much everyone for coming please um keep an eye on your inbox because you'll be given a recording of this over the next few days as well and please share this with anyone who you think will benefit from it and also keep an eye on your inbox for the next installment of our series which will be coming out via invite link over the coming days as well uh, so please jump on board and we'll see you next time thank you so much again for coming thanks everybody thanks guys chat saved and now we will be ending <laughs> bye thanks everyone